June 22nd, 1969, this event happened in the United States. Does anybody know what it was? The Cuyahoga River spontaneously caught on fire because there was so much industrial waste in that river. The next year, uh, my family moved to Cleveland because my father was transferred there with U.S. Steel, and fortunately, I was too young to, to know I was moving to a city where fires, you know, just erupted on, in the rivers. April 22nd, 1970, there was an event that happened for the first time ever in cities all over the world. Anybody know what that was? The very first Earth Day. Very first Earth Day. Later that same year, December 2nd, 1970, do we know what happened? EPA, Richard Nixon enacted legislation to create the EPA. Today, if you visit Cleveland, Ohio, you can fish in the Cuyahoga River. My father, when he uh, retired, loved to go there in the fall when the steelhead would come in from the lake. So uh, this is a story of bottoms up transformation. The Cuyahoga River did not get cleaned up because some billionaire swept in and said, I'll fix that. It did not get cleaned up because some politician said, I'll fix that. Trust me, Richard Nixon did not campaign on the environment. <laughs> His hand was forced by individuals like yourselves. So why am I telling you this story? Well, we talk a lot about transformation at TSIA and specifically this business model transformation around as a service. And from the chair that I sit in, I am privileged to see how companies are, are navigating this as a service transformation. And for a lot of companies, not all companies, for a lot of companies, it kind of looks like this right now. <laughs> the as a service transformation, the state of it within your companies. Does that look familiar? Does it feel familiar? Yeah, okay, good, just validating. So, so why, why is that true? Because this is a wicked hard transformation, which we have been saying for years. You have to change the value propositions. As we talked about compelling as a service offers on this stage, it's not just about getting things up into the cloud. You have to change the way you are engaging with customers from a sales and service perspective and Perhaps most you know, difficult, you have to change the way you're making money. And you know, all this transformation is, is really uh, crippling executive teams and boards. And there's, there's lots of you know, th things they're struggling with, but I'm going to give you the top three that I see in reverse order. Number three, they don't fully understand the task at hand. And it's not because they're not wicked smart people. That's you know, how they got where they are. They just have zero experience with as a service business models. The second challenge is that they are underestimating the time and treasure required to go through this transformation. And we, JB and I were in a breakout uh, with executives and, and we were talking about the fish and someone said, I hate that fish. Every time you so show that fish, my CEO and the CFO just kind of say, they turn away, they shut down. But there is a fish. It is what it is. And the number one reason I see them struggling is they are unwilling to make the tough changes, to break the glass. They don't want to make that organizational change that's going to upset people. They don't want to take money from that legacy BU that's been very successful for the company and, and give it to this new BU for as a service. They just don't want to make the tough changes. And by the way, if you want to hear more on that challenge, I encourage you to listen to a podcast that I recorded with Jeff Moore that I think is going to drop here in about a week where we talk about that challenge you know, within the executive suite on transformation. So we're going to do some polling here. And this is a safe place. Everything's anonymous. And I want you to be intellectually honest on these two polls. Number one, does your executive team understand how to scale a profitable as a service business model? Yes. No, or if you want the easy way out, <laughs> do I have to answer? And again, I know we have a virtual audience as well, so let's, let's get a good set of data here. 
take a moment, get on those phones, and be honest. And usually the data normalizes pretty quickly here as the votes come in. So 70, 30, maybe-ish. I, do I have to answer? So clearly over half of you, all right, 60% of you are saying, you know, they don't understand. It's a very common challenge, right? You're not alone. Let's go to the second poll. Is your executive team willing to make the tough changes required to support a new business model? Same, same question, yes, no, do I have to answer? So even you know, as they're learning what to do, at some point they are gonna you know, understand what's going on and they're gonna have to make some tough choices here. So the, people are a little more confident that they'll make some of the tough choices, but still, a little over 40% of you are saying no, they're not willing to do this. And so these responses speak volumes. And it results in this dynamic as we cut back to the slides. This is what happens. Now, they're not saying this out loud, but I would argue that inaction speaks volumes. Inaction is worth a thousand words. And I know this is frustrating a lot of you because of this dynamic. Do you know what this is? All roads lead to Rome. All roads lead to Rome. All roads lead to that executive suite. You're trying to get stuff done. By the way, I remember the first time I heard this phrase, I was very young, and when I heard it, I looked out my window, I looked at the street in front of my house, I'm like, that really goes to Rome? I, I, I'm not sure how that gets there. I was very confused, very confused. But this is frustrating, right? Because we're trying to move forward and these big decisions aren't getting made. So another quick poll here. Do you feel that you, as an individual, can influence the future success of your company? Yes, no, or sort of, you know, kind of it depends, Thomas. How do you feel? How empowered do you feel right now? Oh, this data is interesting and encouraging. So about 75% of you, more now, 79, 80, are saying, yes, I think I can make a difference, which is fantastic. But one cautionary tale here, as we go to the next slide, is this dynamic, and I see this happening. And what do you do? You say, look, man, the executives aren't making the, the tough decisions. That department over there, man, like our product people aren't moving fast enough, or these people aren't moving, sales people aren't getting it yet. I'm just gonna double down and take care of, of my area. Hit my P&L, hit my numbers. But there's a, a problem with this. In this scenario, the boat still sinks. <laughs> the boat still sinks. So I would submit to you, this is not okay. This is not gonna be okay. So it leads us to this challenge. Right, we're stuck in this transformation. We're not moving fast enough. Our executives aren't making the big decisions. This is a challenge. So let me ask you one more question. Are you responsible for the future success of your career? Forget the company, whether they turn the bend on this thing or not. Are you responsible for your future career? Yes, no. Let's take a look at this data. 92, 93, I would submit that should be 100%, 100%. Nobody owns your career but you. It's not in it depends. <laughs> it's not, hey, my executives don't get it and that's why I'm not being successful here. In terms of your career, you own it. And because of that, oh, that's good, the number's going up now. <laughs> because of that, that's why I wanna talk about personal as a service transformation. Let's forget the company. So we're gonna continue our theme today of personal development. We had it in the opening keynote and we're gonna have it in the closing keynote today. And the personal as a service transformation journey, I am going to recommend three distinct steps here. Educate, assess, and act. And let's start with educate. 
So when you start thinking about as a service business models, there's a lot of new concepts that are flying around here. People are talking about TCV and ACV and renewal rates and churn, and there's just a lot of new thoughts. And if I'm you know, mentoring a technology executive personally, I basically tell, tell them, look, you need to get an MBA in as-a-service business models. You need to get an MBA in this. You need to understand what these business models are about because they're eating through all of these technology markets. Everybody in this room at some point is going to have to deal with these new business models. And there's a lot to learn, but I'm going to put on the table that there are seven concepts about as-a-service business models that everybody, I don't care if you're in sales, I don't care if you're in services, product management, finance, I don't care. You should be conversant on these seven core concepts. And I'm going to go through them at, at a higher level, and, and obviously TSI has a lot of deep content on all of these, and you should be leaning into that content. But let me just give you the high level. And we're going to start with as-a-service economic engines. How you make money in an as-a-service business model. And we know historically, and if, if you've been to these conferences, we've shown these gears before, the old tech business models, when customers were buying technology, running it on site, we had two economic engines that dominated our business models. Product providers got most of their revenue from selling the product, very light service touches. That would have been Cisco historically, that would have been Microsoft, Autodesk, a lot of hardware and software companies ran that engine very successfully. And then we had these product extenders, which were really uh, complex enterprise software companies where the big cash cow was maintenance, right? And these two models were incredibly profitable. And many of you have models that look very close to this, even to this day, right? But the revenue streams are, are shifting here. So we're still selling product. It doesn't go away tomorrow. But we have more and more technology subscription where the customer buys to get access to the technology per user, consumption base, whatever. And then we have more and more of these annuity services. So not just support, but managed services, premium customer success services. And we also have a dynamic that's unfolding that Bo you know, can tell you about, where people are taking things that were traditionally project-based services, like PS, and actually saying, let's turn that into an annuity, recurring service. So things are, are, are shifting here. And I'm, I'm going to give you a little pop quiz here to just test how in tune you are with these new economic engines. On average, how much revenue do SaaS companies, on average, a SaaS company have coming from monetizing professional services? Is that less than 5%, greater than 15%? What do you think it is? About 20% of you think it's less than 5 and yet almost 40% of you think it's greater than 15 That's a pretty big spread. Pretty big spread in our understanding of how SaaS companies make money. Let's go to the answer. It's 10%. It's about 10%. And we know this from public data. We also know this from our, our annual org structure survey we, we do where we get economic engine data. And so on average, SaaS companies monetize PS about 10%. But I can tell you, we also know that it's tough to have a profitable business model when you only have that much coming from services. And we see it in this data. Most of you know we track the, the TSI TNS50 50 of the largest tech companies on the planet, like the Cisco's and the SAP's and et cetera, they are, are, are not growing as fast, but they're very profitable. You go down to the TSI Cloud 40, they're growing fast, but on average, they're break even. Many of them losing money. And the thing you need to understand about economic engines and as a service is as you get more customers, right? Things don't automatically just get better in terms of profitability. If we look at the gross margin profile of Workday, Splunk, Zendesk, ServiceNow, LogMeIn, all very successful as a service companies, as they get more and more customers, you don't automatically see gross margin just always goes up. And more importantly, profitability, EBITDA, does not magically just go up, right? Again, I don't care if sales, finance, whatever. You need to understand these dynamics right now. Well, what's going on here? Well, the challenge is the most profitable revenue streams from the old models, maintenance, selling a license, are decreasing, right, less revenue. And the fastest growing revenue streams like SaaS, like managed services are lower 
gross margin profile. And as we study this, we, again, as I mentioned earlier, we know that if you have an economic engine, you're, you're building your new as a service offer, and you're like, we'll just, you know, we'll just monetize the technology, we'll throw services in mostly for free, that's tough to make money. We know that when people diversify the economic engine, and I, you know, I don't care how you price this, discreetly, bundled, doesn't matter, you get a more profitable business model. And if you're curious about that question of do we bundle, what are we charging for, we have a great paper on this, should we charge for this? So I encourage TSI members to check on that because what I am seeing in a lot of companies, this, this discussion which is old as dirt, is why don't we just throw the services in for free because good stuff will happen later. <laughs> right? We've heard this before. So read that paper. So in terms of educate, the first thing everybody should be leaning into is understanding how are we going to make money in these, these new as-a-service offers? Do we understand the economic engines? What are the dynamics there? You should be conversant on that. That's not somebody else's problem. For your career, understand that. The second thing you should understand is what makes a compelling as-a-service offer? We did a panel on this. And I'll do a quick polling question. Do you believe technical feature functionality is commoditizing, yes or no? And again, be intellectually honest. For your markets, is it the winning attribute? that most of you are internalizing this fact that feature functionality is commoditizing. It's harder and harder to differentiate by that. But let me ask you the second more critical polling question. Let's go to the next one. Does your company behave like technical feature functionality is commoditizing? Let's see where this goes. So you believe it, a majority of you believe that, but how are you operating as a company? Let's take a look at that. Data says, flipped, right, 60-40, 70-30. It's a problem. Companies are still operating like you know, that matters. And so as, as we go back to the slides here, you've got to be, again, personally thinking about this. What makes a compelling offer? How do we go from sell, slinging feature functionality to being linked more to business KPIs and, and outcomes? And what are those compelling attributes for us, for our company, for our offers. And again, we did a panel on this. I, I, I did a one-on-one -on -one meeting here, and the company was you know, uh, talking about wanting to do new, new offers, and they were very focused on you know, the pricing, right? sort of financial engineering. Well, they don't buy it, now they just rent it. And I'm like, well, why, why are they even moving to your as-a-service offer? It's not just a pricing, financial engineering. There's gotta be some compelling attributes. What are those? You gotta do that homework. So you should be conversant on that topic. And I'm, and I'm just curious, uh, I threw this one in. Why will customers buy your as a service offers? So I'll give you a couple options here. I'm just curious what you think you should be leaning on as a company. I always like to test on this one to kind of see where, the, where, where people are focused. Lower cost of ownership always gets a lot of votes but new value propositions are winning the day right now, and that warms my heart. <laughs> that means that people have been listening for the, for the past three days, because we've been hammering on the fact that it unlocks new value propositions. Perfect, that's fantastic. Okay, back to the slides. So the, your second homework here on educating. Study, understand, why are customers gonna buy your offers? Third concept I think you need to, to, to be conversant in pricing models, as a service pricing model. So we were working on this new book, and um, as the research team was meeting on it, this is a, a framework that we were playing with. And by the way, there's a chapter in the book on value-based pricing that Laura Fay wrote, and I, I have to tell you, I think it's the best literature I've read on, on really understanding value-based pricing. Um, so when that comes out, click into that chapter. But this is what's going on, right? Pricing is going from being based on per user to now there's all this heat on consumption-based. We mentioned that earlier, and companies like Autodesk going to you know, 24 hours, you're able to use their software and you turn it back off, right? Same time, we're moving from selling products to selling platforms to trying to move to platform business models. And so you know, companies are moving from the traditional models, the lower left, where we, we sold you know, the technology um, per user, and, and moving to the right. 
And so what does that mean to you <laughs> and your business? So again, do not defer this and say, well, that, you know, the, the finance people have to figure out pricing. We have a group that does pricing. I, I don't need to understand as a service pricing. You do. <laughs> you do need to be conversant in this, whether, again, you're in sales, you're in services. How are these models changing? Next topic, the as-a-service offer continuum. What the heck is that? Well, this is a, a, a diagram that comes from George's work, Humphrey, in the area of managed services. And because he works with a lot of companies that are, you know, have, they have hardware or technology on site, and now they're starting to get in the motion of managing it. And so you want to understand where is my company on the spectrum? And what's typically happening is you move from saying, look, I've got technology on site that was never connected. Now I've got it connected. The customer still owns it but now I've got it connected. That's usually the first move on the chessboard. Well, now maybe it's still on, on site, it's connected, and I'm now responsible for managing it. Or maybe we moved it off site, and it's dedicated to that customer sort of one-to-one, -one, but I'm managing it. Or maybe finally we've really truly reached multi-tenant cloud. But again, where are you on the spectrum, and do you understand that? So when your product people or your managed services people are talking about these different flavors of offers, it's going to be somewhere on the spectrum. And so let's do, again, a little sort of pop quiz here. What as a service offer types does your company have? I should have put it, I don't know. I'm sorry, I forgot to put that option. Are you on-prem, but now you're managing it? Do you now have it, it's hosted, dedicated, but you know, just for that customer? Or are you really truly made it to multi-tenant? Let's see where people are. Hey, George, man, there's a lot of on-prem manage going on. <laughs> That's no, no surprise. Exactly what we expect. All of these examples are in the wild. And again, for you personally understanding what does my company have in play, right? Do I understand that? Okay, go back to the slides. So understand that one. Educate yourself. The next concept is around what we call the as-a-service waterfall. And I'll, again, simple pop quiz. Does your company have a well-defined and adopted way to calculate annual recurring revenue, ARR, which is a foundational concept when you start talking about as-a-service business models? So do you know how your company calculates that? Yes, no, or uh, I don't know. Let's see how the data comes in on this one. Yeah, yeah, this is interesting. I've been listening for three days how everybody wants to build recurring revenue streams, and yet less than half of us really know how we're even calculating that revenue stream, right? Which is not surprising. But it, for this room here, it should be 100%. You should know that. Okay, back to the slides. So we have very specific definitions. You know, I'm gonna run you through them for, at TSIA. Your company can have a modified version of, uh, of this, but you should, you should understand you know, what these are. Because this is important, if I just jump back here, on the as a service waterfall, this is now what you are gonna be living and dying by, right, as, as a company. And, and we talked about this a little bit in, in, in the panel with, with Laura and Hal, but you start this year, and when you really get through this transformation, the beginning of, the, of, of, the, of the, you know, your fiscal year, you're actually going to know where a majority of your revenue is coming from because <laughs> you're renewing these contracts. That's why investors love these business models. But then what happens after that? Again, you know, downselling, you know, churn, pricing, et cetera. You need to be comfortable with that terminology and how your company is calculating it. And again, we have clear definitions on this. Um, you need to understand what your company, how your company is calculating it. So research that, understand that. The next one is around adoption analytics. And everybody is very familiar with the layer framework. Uh, the, you know, it's funny, you know, I get in more discussions now with people in the industry that um, they'll say, oh, layer, that's been around forever. And I said, well, yeah, 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 we put that on the table at TSIA. And they said, oh, no, no, you didn't. That's, that's an industry framework. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm pretty sure that was us. But anyway, it was us. It was us. And in this framework, the first step is adoption. And that adoption, as we've said, been saying for, you know, ever since we put it on the table, is being driven by analytics, data, 
right? And that data feeds into your customer success teams. And what do they do? They use that so you can drive expansion and renew. But you, as a professional in this industry, you need to click into this thing called adoption. And I would submit to you, this is not just, you know, the customer success folks have to figure this out or my, my analytics team has to figure this out. If you guys were walking around saying, oh, there are customer adoption scores are really great. Okay, why? Well, what's in there? What, what does your company look at? And again, at TSIA, we have framing on this, uh, you know, examples of what people can look at to, to understand if adoption is going from low to high to effective. We also have frameworks on what people do with that adoption data and the type of analytics that go from, you know, just about service efficiency to really getting to helping customers get to outcomes. So there's really good content and framing there for you, but you need to, again, look at your own company and what are we doing? And what, by the way, what do other companies do? Can I, am I conversant on the topic of adoption or am I just slinging that word around at a very high level and I have no idea how my company or other companies really calculate that. This is too foundational. Adoption is the currency in these new business models, so you want to be conversant in it. The next one is, is the role of customer success. And I'll start this, why this is so important, with, with this, these financial realities. When you look at traditional uh, software companies, you know, they're very profitable. Again, on average, the last snapshot from the TNS-50, they're making 22 points of profit. Compare that with a SaaS company that's over $500 million of revenue, so this is not some little, you know, just startup, right? They're making less than 10%. Some of them, even at that level, are unprofitable. W why? Why? Because these SaaS companies, these as-a-service business models, are spending a boatload of money in SGNA. And, and we've been saying for years, Houston, we have a problem. But we also have been saying, Houston, we have a solution. <laughs> we have a point of view on how to fix this. And it is about the role of customer success in the model. And we know from our benchmark data that customer success organizations have been getting more and more responsibility around commercials, around lead generation, cross sell and upsell. We know that 76% of customer organizations customer success organizations own renewals. And we know that's a really good thing. We have tons of correlation data that shows the beautiful things that get unlocked, including the fact that if you stop having salespeople worry about renewals, your overall subscription revenues grow faster because they're focusing on growth. We talked about it you know, with Salesforce, that it's not a bug, it's a feature to have this tension between sales focused on land, customer success really owning the, the renewal. And so you need to understand those nuances between a little c customer success organization, which is a financial art project, versus a mature customer success organization that you can scale. And we have a chapter in the upcoming book on customer success at scale. And I can tell you, again, at a high level, the three big levers, you gotta monetize, you need to give customer success commercial responsibility, and you need to start you know, basically getting that sales dividend where you don't need as many salespeople to drive revenue. But you need to click into this. You need to be able to talk intelligently with salespeople, with service people, with product people about the role of customer success. So I just gave you a flyby of just seven core concepts that I think every professional in the technology industry needs to understand as things move to as a service. And I'm sure you, know, you can do your own self-assessment. You say, look, I really understand one and four. I'm a, I'm a little you know, not so sure on number two, whatever. I think all seven, again, you don't have to be the, you know, the masters of this for your company, but be conversant. Understand the core concepts here. Make sense? Okay, that's step one. Second step in this personal as a service transformation journey is assess, assess. So let me ask a tough question. How often do you formally assess, I'll say the strength or the health of the company you're working for? Never, you never kind of think about it. Once a year do you kind of think, oh, hey, I wonder where my company's going. Do you do it quarterly? Or maybe there's some other kind of cadence. I'm very curious how often you personally think about the strength or health or viability of the company you're working for. 
and I have no idea how this data is going to come out. I'm very interested. I'm going to give this one a while because I, I really want to get a good sampling here. Never is a, is a lot lower than I thought. Never is a lot lower than I thought. I would have bet, uh, you know, a chunk that that would be at least 20%. And maybe it's because of times we live in. <laughs> because these business models are changing and it's now more, much more top of mind than ever. I mean, geez, oh man. I mean, half of you are thinking about this quarterly. Quarterly. That says, that speaks volumes right there. That speaks volumes. So that's good. I think you should be thinking about this as we go back to the slides. And if you're thinking about assessing your company, the viability to health, I mean, the natural things that you can think about, hey, are we growing and are we profitable? Two natural things to think about. But in, when we're going through business model transformation as, in an industry, there's other things that start to matter even more, right? Does your company even have any as a service offers? <laughs> How much revenue is you know, coming from that? Are, are we able to talk about outcomes in vertical industries, right? Does, does my leadership team understand these new models? These things start to become more important, and I encourage you to think about these attributes. But I'll give you, you know, some criteria that you can use for your company to, to, to really sort of be, you know, intellectually honest about how are we doing. And you can start with your economic engine, how much money is coming from as a service, and if that's, you know, a rounding error, less than 5%, right? Vertical position, are we building muscle to understand vertical industries, yes or no? You can look at cash flow from operations in terms of are you getting better, stable, worse. Think about your offer types. Are they compelling as a service offers? Look at your investor messaging. If you're a public company, what are your executives saying to investors? about where the growth of your company is going to come from. And the last thing you can always test on for a public company, even a private company, is we call it the revenue multiplier. What's my annual revenues compared to the valuation of the company? And by the way, if we just look at one of these factors, cash flow from operations for th these companies here, Palo Alto Networks, Viva, Autodesk, Fortinet, they're all getting better. And by the way, those are companies that are doing very well in this as a service transformation, or they're already there. Viva is a very profitable SaaS company, for example. Palo Alto Networks has moved the needle from zero to 47% coming from true as a service offers. Autodesk, as we know, has gone through it, right? So that's just one example. But look at all that criteria. And the rating system is simple here. Look at your company versus maybe some of your key competitors and say, how are we doing on those factors, on, on, on as a service offers, is how much revenue is coming, on investor messaging. And when I say that we're kind of neutral, we look like everybody else, we're weak compared to competitors, or are we strong? And I will promise you, <laughs> as you go through this exercise and you look at your own company and some of your competitors, what you're gonna see is this incredible correlation where the first five criteria, if you're strong on those, you're gonna have a great revenue multiplier. And if you are weak on those, you're gonna have a not so great <laughs> revenue multiplier. That math plays out again and again. So I encourage you to do that. Why? Because it sets you up for the hardest part of this journey. The hardest part of personal as a service transformation. And that is to act. That is to act. So let me ask a question. Who has primary responsibility for change management at your company? Is it the executive team? Do you have like a strategy or change management team? Or do you think it's actually the employees? Or, or is it somehow some other way change management is getting done? Because again, we're talking about the need to go through a business model transformation. Where do you think the primary responsibility for that lives within your company? And again, I'm very anxious to see this data. 40% saying executive team, individual employees, a lot higher than I would have guessed, 30%-ish. Not too many people, you know, hoping that that strategy or, you know, transformation team pulls this off. I think the one stunning thing here, uh, JB, I'll go back to a conversation that we were in in one of those breakouts. Only 40% of you are saying it's the executive team's responsibility, but boy, you get in these meetings and everybody's like, it's the executive team. <laughs> it's the exe Again, the all roads lead to Rome problem, right? But I, you know, I agree with the fact that it's, it shouldn't be as weighted on the executive team. And, and here's what I think is very interesting about change management. 
as we go back to the slides. If you look at the literature on change management, go Google change management, go look at books on change management, right? And it really is all about of, hey, we're these you know, leaders, these executives, we know we need to change, and these darn employees are just slowing us down. So here's how you're gonna keep them happy. <laughs> here's how you're gonna make sure they don't freak out as we go through this change, right? So it's, what's implied here, right, what is implied is that, is that the C-suite is dragging all of you through transformation, right? That is the mentality when we talk about change management. That's not what I see right now in as a service transformation. What I see is people like you <laughs> trying to push this transformation rope uphill. And you're saying, I know we need to change this. I know, we, you know this is not working over here. We've got to change these offers. We've got to invest differently. We've got to dot, dot, dot. And I, you know, the executive team's not pulling on the other side of the rope. So you need to act as individuals. You need to act. So what can you do? I think the first thing you need to do is you need to start asking really hard questions <laughs> to your direct manager in the all-hands meetings, right? You need to start asking the hard questions. And I'm, I'm curious if you've asked any of these questions to your manager or, or, or your executive team directly, any of these. So take a look at them, you know, things around, do we have as a service offers, plan to release, how much are we gonna invest in this area? How do we avoid being commoditized? Are we hiring people that understand the new business models? Just read those questions. Those are hard questions for management teams that are not moving fast enough. So let's take a look at the data. Good. Investing is high. How much are we investing in these new, these new capabilities? That's good. Followed by how do we avoid being commoditized? Yeah, that kind of goes hand in hand. But unfortunately, over 20% of you aren't asking any of these questions because they're tough questions. They're uncomfortable questions. But these are the questions you want to start asking because it's your career that we're navigating here. So let's go back to the slides. Ask the hard questions, and then you need to be prepared for the tough conversations. And that's why the first step is educate. Don't go in with guns blazing, asking all these hard questions about as a service and you don't know what the hell you're talking about, okay? I don't think that's the winning strategy for any of you. So educate, start asking the hard questions and be prepared for the tough conversations and avoid this. This is not helpful. This is not helpful. Sort of just launching these uninformed grenades into the dialogue. And trust me, I see this a lot. I see stakeholders getting together, they're not really informed, and they're, and they're saying, well, I talked to, you know, I know exactly what Salesforce is doing on dot, 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 and they have no idea what Salesforce is doing, right? Or I talked to my buddy golfing last week, and he told me, you know, dot, dot, dot. That's not the real deal, right? So you want to come into this basically educated and armed so you can have productive conversations. And the third thing on ACT, is I recommend you set a personal deadline, a personal deadline. So a goal is a dream with a deadline, <laughs> right? So you have a goal, I think, everyone in this room, to be a successful professional in the technology industry, regardless of what your role is. I think every one of you have that shared goal. And to meet that goal, I recommend you have a deadline. And the deadline is related to this. How long will you work for a company that is struggling to adapt its business model? How long? And I know this is a very personal answer because you might be saying, Thomas, man, I've got you know, a decade, 15 years invested in this company. I love this company. I love the people. So for you, you, know, you probably have more runway here. You know, my, my son, who's only three years out of college and is sitting in the audience, you know, his runway is probably shorter. <laughs> He's not going to tolerate this very long if the company's thrashing on this topic. But this data, I'm very interested to see. This is, I want this snapshot afterwards. Note to the production team, I want to make sure I get this data. So a majority of you, 60% of you, are willing to give your company one to three years. And I would say, I have two reactions to that. Number one, I think because you know this is not going to happen in a quarter or two. So you are educated on that part, which is fantastic. Number two, I, I think that shows some loyalty. 
I think, you know, they always say that nobody's loyal anymore. If you're willing to give a management team multiple years, right, I think that's, that's fantastic. Some of you more than five years. But I think you do have to answer that question for yourself. And I would think about it and I would hit the button and start that clock ticking. So if it is, if your answer is, you know, one to three years, and three years from now you're sitting at a TSW conference and you're bemoaning the fact that your <laughs> management team doesn't get it and that, you know, you, it, it's not moving anywhere, it's time. It is time. And I go back to the story that I opened up with. This transformation, the Cuyahoga River, right, was all about in the bottoms up, individual transformation. I predict, I feel, for many companies in this room, that's going to be your winning scenario, right? That's going to be your winning scenario, is you're going to have to agitate from the bottom up. And my message to you here is agitate for change or change companies. Agitate for change or change companies, because I guarantee you there's nothing that is going to get the attention of a stalled executive team then when they see their best and brightest, which I submit are probably sitting in this room, walking out the door. <laughs> that is going to get their attention. Thank you. Really appreciate your time.